On this special edition of Independent Sources, what now? As hundreds of victims of Hurricane Sandy may end up on the streets. We have families that have 10 household members or seven household members or something like that. Finding an apartment in New York City, uh, if you're of modest means to accommodate that many people is extraordinarily challenging, let alone a Section 8 unit uh, or some other kind of housing. And the ethnic media, unsung heroes of the storm. I mean, the community people, instead of three, calling 311, they, they feel better to call uh, a newspaper office where they can get the information in their own language. Those stories and more coming up on Independent Sources. Welcome to Independent Sources. I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. This week we're going to take a special look at the city one year after Hurricane Cindy. Much of the media nicknamed the disaster Superstorm Cindy. The Category 1 hurricane affected more than 8 million people in 15 states and was the second most expensive storm in U.S. history. It cost New York State $42 billion in federal aid. An estimated $70 million of that money went to the city's hotel program for people displaced by the storm. Hundreds of them are still being housed in more than two dozen hotels around the city and are in danger of becoming homeless as New York's federal funding has run dry. Sarah Pizan spoke to Stephen Banks of the Legal Aid Society and Peter Gudetis of New York Disaster Interface Services about how their organizations are trying to help the displaced. So Stephen, back in May, your organization helped uh, obtain a city hotel program extension for the Sandy victims. How is your organization helping out the victims today? Well, at that time, there were some uh, thousand people in the uh, evacuee hotels, and the city was proposing to simply put them out in the street. And as a result of the court order, uh, literally hundreds of individuals have been able to uh, secure other housing and move out. And really, all we went to court for was to make sure that people have enough time to move out. Now that the order's been lifted, uh, we're down to the last group of about 100 households or so. We're very grateful to be working with our colleagues uh, here who have just stepped in at the 11th hour, literally, with the resources that are needed to give the last group of people just a little bit more time. Most of them are actually linked uh, to uh, subsidies in order to move into permanent housing. And again, that's why it seems so counterproductive for the city's effort to simply cut the program off when all it was going to be a little more time to keep these people who have suffered so much with a roof over their heads until they'd be able to put a, uh, a plan together to move out. And we're very thankful for the court's order that gave that opportunity and now for the assistance from our colleagues who have been able to work uh, hand in glove with our staff to link each of these individuals to some sort of assistance. And Peter, can you tell us a little bit more about who these families are? We took on approximately 101 households, which represent about 190 individuals. And they break down over a variety of categories. What we did was work with Legal Aid Society to determine which of those households uh, had an outcome in front of them that was clear or very present, if you will. And we've already moved some of those families into their permanent housing. Um, we have another 30 or so households that are very close. And what we do is work with Legal Aid Society to sort of triage them to get to the families that are closest to the line and move them forward and make sure not only do they move into permanent housing, but they actually have the resources to sustain that move once they've made it. So it's in the best interests of all of us that once a household is kind of resettled, that they have all their needs addressed to make sure that that family is self-sufficient, not just that they've moved from one emergency housing crisis to another. But one year after Sandy, why are some people still, why have some people still haven't moved back to their homes compared well, I, to others? Um, I, I do think that there is a misconception out there, as with many clients that are challenged by life circumstances, that this is somehow an issue of laziness or a lack of initiative on their part. Uh, I think that's an extraordinarily <laughs> extraordinary simplification of the circumstances. Mm -hmm. 
And typically it takes households that have been impacted by a disaster, particularly a catastrophic housing disaster, years uh, to recover. Mm -hmm. And it is uh, always challenging in an urban environment where housing is challenged in general. So many of these families have been in uh, the waiting process for approval for certain disaster assistance. So it does seem rather arbitrary to kind of throw them out of one set of housing when other programs haven't uh, expedited those applications to figure out what's a better course for them. So for instance, it may be cheaper for us to um, put a client in an apartment than it is to pay a $200 a night hotel bill. So we are about conserving resources. But in general, these, these clients have complicated cases. We have families that have 10 household members or seven household members or something like that. Finding an apartment in New York City, uh, if you're of modest means to accommodate that many people is extraordinarily challenging, let alone a Section 8 unit uh, or some other kind of housing. But also these clients want proximity to their homes, to their families, to their support systems, to the cultural communities that they come from, and it's not really just as simple as go find an apartment. Okay. And Stephen, what are the criteria for the family you choose to help? Well, we brought a case on behalf of all the families and all the households that were in the hotels because that's what Legal Aid's role is, to be the safety net when all other safety nets fail. Uh, this is a situation in which uh, individual families uh, and uh, households came to our attention together with the Coalition for the Homeless. We were in the evacuation hotels. These were uh, clients that were seeking our assistance, and it was critical to go to court to keep them with a roof over their head and not uh, end up on the streets or in the shelter system. It's important to remember that before uh, Superstorm Sandy hit, there were 50,000 uh, adults and children in the city's municipal shelter system. And these additional households were rendered homeless as a result of the storm. So these individuals and, and their families uh, ended up uh, uh, in a very tight housing market in which their housing was literally wiped out and in which there are already 50,000 uh, New Yorkers who couldn't find housing. So it's no surprise that a year later it's been very difficult for these households to get back into the housing market. And frankly, it's only as a result of the federal assistance that came targeted to these families that they're able to put together the ability to move out of the evacuation hotels. But um, I have to agree with what Peter said. That's why it made no sense for the city to rush in May to uh, terminate these placements when the federal assistance wasn't even in place. And Peter, you, your organization received, well, there was a Red Cross donation of $1 million uh, to extend temporary housing for Sandy victims. Who is this money helping and for how long? Like how many families is this money helping? Well, th their grant, which w is absolutely generous, it was $1.15 million, and it was actually targeted at the 52 households that the city had identified prior to their eviction uh, as having received uh, what's called TDAP, Temporary Disaster Assistance, it's, which is a voucher for them to secure new housing. And that was for six weeks for those 52 families. So as you can imagine, we picked up 101 families right. uh, and families that do not yet have a TDAP voucher but are close or in some process, as well as Section 8 uh, clients and clients who are w waiting for contractors to finish on their property. So the Red Cross grant will cover um, hopefully about two-thirds of the cost of what we're looking at at the moment, but we already know that some of these households will be with us probably into December um, because their homes are being uh, repaired or rebuilt in some cases and they, they just have no place to go. So where are they going to go? They're going to stay in the hotels with us until their homes are ready. Um, the, the longest one we're going to have is mid-December, and that's a family of 10, uh, and their home is being rebuilt on Staten Island by the Stephen Siller Foundation and Mennonite Disaster Services, and I think they'll be the longest one. So the others will attrition out over time when their housing becomes available. Can you clarify a little bit how you're going to be, how your organization is going to be paying for providing for these? Well, the, the Unmet Needs Roundtable, which we administer in all of the boroughs, uh, has a fund of approximately $8.5 million mm -hmm. to address the unmet needs of 
survivor households. So for what the Red Cross grant does not cover, um, those other funds will be applied to those households. Okay. And we're very grateful for the work that the disaster interfaith services are, are providing um, and along with the Red Cross assistance. I mean, it's in great contrast, this outpouring of support for these families is a great contrast to the city's rush to cut them off. Uh, but fortunately, I think through a great partnership on the ground of your staff and our staff, we've been able to, uh, along with the Coalition for the Homeless, we've been able to avoid uh, near communities for change, people ending up in the streets. Right. I wanted to ask you something, Stephen. I read that, uh, well, under New York law, people cannot be technically thrown out of their, if they stay out for more than 30 days in one particular spot, they cannot be thrown out. Yet there have been some reports and some articles about how some uh, Sandy, you know, victims have been, you know, kicked out of their hotel rooms. What exactly are the rights of the Sandy refugees? Well, there is the right to remain in a place if you've been there for 30 days under these particular circumstances. But unfortunately, like we see so often in the work that we do in all five boroughs at the Legal Aid Society, that uh, there are laws that exist in the books, and then oftentimes it requires a lawyer in order to have your rights vindicated. And that's what our frontline staff has been doing uh, in many cases around the clock, helping individuals remain in place, working together with the uh, faith-based groups uh, to ensure that people uh, are able to keep a roof over their heads and move out. Uh, these are households, their children, their adults who have suffered enough as a result of the storm. And it's in all of our interests to ensure they don't end up on the streets. And what is the future looking like for the remaining people that are in those city programs, I in think, the hotel programs? I think I we're optimistic uh, and confident that the remaining households that we're working with, that working together with, will be able to uh, transition from the hotels into some uh, type of permanent arrangement rather than end up either on the streets or in the city's uh, over already overcrowded shelter system. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. When we come back, Helping Hands trying to rebuild some areas affected by Cindy. Before that, Avi Hishola has some other news. Thanks, Gary. Here's a look at some headlines from New York's ethnic and community media. From the World Journal, Chinatown will soon get a landmark after a 40-year-long delay. The Chinatown Business Improvement District is working with a group of architectural students from New York City College of Technology to design a landmark for the bustling area. Four teams of students are working to plan the open area project the designers hope will establish a sense of community and attract crowds of people. LDRL La Prenza reports that transgender women face greater job discrimination than heterosexuals and others in the LGBTQ community. According to a study done by the community organization Make the Road New York, 41% of transgender women who were interviewed have endured severe harassment at work. That's compared to 29% of gays, lesbians, and bisexuals. 32% were fired when they identified themselves as transgender or admitted to hormone replacement therapy. From the Amsterdam News, New Lots Avenue in East New York has been renamed. The area will now be called African Burial Ground Square. Three years ago, the remains of African slaves were discovered on Livonia Avenue between Barbie Street and Schneck Avenue. Catherine Green, who co-founded the project and Councilman Charles Barron's office, made the discovery after finding a map from 1878 that showed an African burial ground. And finally, the Jewish Daily Forward is offering some comical advice on how Jews should celebrate a rare mashup holiday, Thanksgivinga. This year, Thanksgiving and Hanukkah fall on the same day for the first time since 1888. The anomaly won't happen again until 2070. In honor of the holiday, the Jewish Forward created a list of six ridiculous things Jews should have on their family table to celebrate. The list includes a quirky Thanksgivinga t-shirt, a fusion of traditional Thanksgiving and Hanukkah dishes like pecan pie arugula, and a minerki, or a sculpture of a turkey that looks like a menorah. Those were just a few headlines from New York's ethnic and community media. Independent sources will be back right after this. Thanks for staying tuned to a special look at New York City's recovery one year after Hurricane Sandy. All Hands Volunteers is a nonprofit organization geared towards assisting in rebuilding communities in the wake of natural disasters. All Hands has helped rebuild communities all over the U.S., from New York to Colorado, and internationally in places such as the Philippines and Pakistan. Recently, we sat down with Tamara Guglmeyer to talk about the work 
All Hands has been doing to help communities that were devastated by Hurricane Sandy. All Hands is a natural disaster recovery and response organization. So we have both short-term immediate responses and longer-term rebuild and recovery projects. We were founded in 2005. Our founder, David Campbell, uh, traveled to Thailand after the tsunami. He and a number of people, friends, etc., people he met while in Thailand, came together and raised $100,000 to um, put back together or to rebuild five Phuket uh, fishing villages. In terms of Superstorm Sandy, our recovery and relief program here, we've actually been very lucky to have some really uh, strong partnerships on the ground. Robin Hood Foundation has been very instrumental for us, as they have with a lot of nonprofits doing Sandy recovery. Other partnerships with J.P. Morgan Chase, for example, the Japan Chamber of Commerce and Industry, which you might not think would be a large supporter of Superstorm Sandy Relief, but they are. Um, and in particular, they were compelled to support our work because we were in Tohoku uh, and had a project there after the Japan earthquake and tsunami. In our lifetime, we've had over 11,000 volunteers, so we're pretty, pretty proud of that number that we were able to mobilize that many people. For Superstorm Sandy recovery, we've had an amazing outpouring of volunteer support. Um, a lot of it's local, obviously. I'm a New Yorker. I've lived here for about 10 years. So I feel really blessed to uh, be able to work for an organization that's helping put our communities back together. In total, we've had close to 3,000 Sandy volunteers across our projects in Long Island and Staten Island. So for us, that's you know really telling in terms of people really wanting to come out and um, help put our communities back together and using all hands as one vehicle through which to do that. Where we're staying right now, we can house 33 people. So we have a staff of about eight and we'll have anywhere between 20 people staying at the house sometimes as as little as five residential volunteers, but on weekends particularly we'll have larger groups come in and stay with us and then we go out and do the work. Um, a lot of our volunteers come from universities and colleges in the area, uh, church groups as well, but also we have a lot of co corporate groups come to help us. Every day we, we have three crews, we go out and we work on three houses. We do try to find a community that is safe to go in, accessible, and that in the surrounding area has enough work for us to, to work in and stay busy. We don't charge to have volunteers come and volunteer with us. Some organizations do, we certainly don't. Uh, we don't require any specialized skills. A lot of what we do is initial recovery. So we go in uh, as soon as we can after a natural disaster. And we're doing things like mucking and getting homes, which basically just means you know, you could be up to your knees in mud uh, and with shovel all day or tearing out drywall. The project here, we're in Mr. O'Brien's home. He is the first home in our repair program, actually. And as you can see, we've been helping put back uh, drywall. Uh, I think we may have done a little bit of framing here as well. Um, so, you know, it varies from project to project, but basically if you're willing and able and you show up, we have jobs for you. Hurricane Sandy restoked the conversation about climate change. Now, one initiative is trying to involve citizens in the city's plan to address how New York can better adapt to changing weather patterns. I talked to Adam Glenn about the Adapt NYC project. So Adam, tell us about the genesis of this project. Well, when the uh, city uh, experienced uh, the loss and damage from Hurricane Sandy last year, uh, the mayor uh, decided to take a very deep dive into how to make New York City more resilient in case of a future storm. And what we wanted to do with this project was to make sure that there was uh, a real public voice in that process. So we launched in the spring, late spring, when the uh, mayor released a 400 plus page report on what the city would do. And our launch was meant to bring attention to that report, but also to allow communities to look deeper into it and ask the question of how it served them and whether it fit their needs going forward. And how long did this uh, survey take you? 
Well, what we did in the late summer was we decided to look at one particular or body within the city, which is the, the community boards. There are 59 of them. They represent the neighborhoods really at the most local level. Uh, so in late August, August, we started surveying all 59, but we zeroed in on 18 of them, which were the most damaged during Sandy. Um, Give us an example of uh, some of them. Uh, well, um, all of the waterfront areas, uh, Lower Manhattan, clearly, South Brooklyn, uh, South Queens, Staten Island, all suffered a great deal of damage. So you see what in these sort of like uh, vulnerable communities. And That's right. And what, what did you find? Well, what we found was that these communities, um, many of them felt that their communication with the city about how to go forward was failing them. Why? Why was failing them? Well, what was it? What was, who was dropping the ball where? Well, it's, um, uh, there's a little bit of blame to go around, but um, what many of them felt was that the city approached them uh, to solicit ideas, but then there was no real interchange after that. They didn't share a back and forth. So in the end, the city just consolidated ideas from hundreds of individuals and organizations and put together its own report without n really reaching back to the community. On the other hand, some of the communities, some of the community boards are not really, uh, uh, they don't have expertise in these issues. So they were unable to engage the city at that level. Um, so it's a little bit of a problem uh, b in both directions, but clearly it's a problem for the city if the communities aren't on board, don't understand, and aren't engaged. When you say don't understand, is it a linguistic issue or is it the topic, uh, it's technical issues, or what is it about that's we have in this lack of communication? Well, they are very technical issues. Uh, climate change is an extremely complex and long-term problem. And so for a local community, for instance, which is trying to still clean up from Sandy, the idea of how to deal with rising sea levels in 40 or 50 years is both long-term and daunting and very complicated to respond to. However, it will change the face of the city over the coming decades. The city's own plans will make a dramatic difference in how the city looks and how people move around the city, how people live in the city. So it's incumbent on both City Hall and the community boards to get a better understanding of these issues for the long term. Was that the finding from your own research? And if, if not, what did your research find besides that? Well, one of the things that we did find is that the community boards have a very key role uh, in the short term, too, in just communicating some of the things that the city has found about the danger zones, where uh, flooding is possible, where storm surge uh, might damage property and, r and risk lives, and just uh, engaging the community to tell the residents what's happening is an important step. We're in the middle of hurricane season now. We don't know what will come in the next month. Is the city ready? But answer that question for me. I guess that's the big question. Mm -hmm. Are we ready for the next Sunday? No, I don't think I don't think anybody would say we are. Although we're more ready than we were last year, but there are many, many long-term uh, issues that have to be dealt with. Give us a sense of what they are. Some of them. I mean, obviously we can't talk about all of them. Sure. But give us uh, some of the more urgent ones. Mm -hmm. Well, the most urgent one really, I think, is protecting human life. So making sure that uh, every resident of the city has a way to find out whether they're in a z an area, a zone, a flood zone, where they're at risk and need to move in the case of a severe storm. That's really the priority number one. Um, I don't know that the city is in any better shape in terms of communicating that. Um, damage to property, damage to infrastructure are huge but longer term. It, it will take time for the city, years, for the city to uh, both harden structures that exist but also look for uh, ways to use sort of natural systems like wetlands and so on to absorb some of the blow of these storms. I guess the question is, this is a very diverse city with a l large amount of the population where English is their second language and sometimes English is, is extremely poor. Uh, in your finding, what is the city doing to address that challenge? Well, that, that is a very important question, and it's, and it's both the ethnic diversity and also the economic diversity, because really the, uh, the poorer communities are the ones that were harmed most and have been least quick to rebound um, for, for many reasons. Um, but one is that there's this disconnect in the city's communication 
to community boards, and that's the core of our finding. They're not talking together in the way they should. Full, fully half of these 18 that we talked to, um, a fully half of them felt that they were not being heard by the city, their voice was not being heard, and they were not working well with the city in this process, and that's bad news. Great work. Thank you very much, Adam. You're Thanks very for joining welcome. us. Happy to. Still to come, Ethnic Media, the unsung heroes of Hurricane Sandy. Finally from us, as Hurricane Sandy hit the East Coast, the ethnic media served as a lifeline to their respective communities, providing translations of emergency bulletins and assistance after the storm. Abu Tahir, editor of Bangla Patrika, talks about his experience during Hurricane Sandy and how his commitment to the Bangladeshi community goes beyond journalism. If we talk about Sindhi, then it was in a very new experience of Bangladesh community because they never had that kind of experience in the U.S. Day was kind of dark. It was very gloomy and see, it's like anything comes any moment. So everybody was kind of ready to face any kind of situation. The phone started to ring, I think, from about 6 or 5 o'clock five to six o'clock, uh, everybody is calling. I, I think before even, that what could happen, what we have to do. Many people, they want to know, you know, what is their obligation. Like any other New Yorker, Bangladeshis also, they are working class people. They take the train, they take the bus, and all of a sudden everything shut down uh, before Cindy came. So uh, it was kind of uh, very, uh, uh, kind of very, uh, you know, scared moment for them. When uh, the city declared they could stay in the home, don't go out and all these things. They stay in the home. They watch TV um, and the other sorts of, of, of the information. But basically, many people, they don't understand what's going on and what could happen and what they're supposed to do. So then, uh, you know, we were in our office. We opened our office. Uh, even the whole day, whole night, when Cindy happened, we was in our office. Uh, many people, they start to call us, um, you know, uh, do you know what uh, could happen, what we're supposed to do. So we provide whatever information we had, we provide the information. And I think it's helped a lot of people. Mayoral office, whatever they have, they could do, they are doing. But, you know, I mean, the community people, instead of three, calling 311, they, they feel better to call uh, uh, a newspaper office where they can get the information in their own language, where their countrymen is there, and they can get the specific inf information they need. Beyond of the newspaper, uh, you know, um, rules, we play rules like, you know, uh, to spread out the spirit to the people that, okay, please help the people, because a lot of people, they are crying, they need help. It's not that just as a journalist will report it. This is obligation as a resident, this is obligation as a human being, to help the mankind. That's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned to a special Hurricane Cindy one year later. Till next time, be independent-minded. <laughs>